Okay, friends, so I want to continue our discussion on the, the practice of the meditation and uh, especially on the development of the insights. We've already mentioned several times, you know, meditation is a gradual uh, development of mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, and the, uh, in the development of wisdom, you get uh, numerous type of insights. And insights is a type of wisdom, because an insight is uh, something not uh, intellectual. It's like a, it's a direct uh, experience of a transformation of consciousness from its grossest uh, ego-centered standpoint to uh, uh, subtler levels of what I have to call awareness or a transition from ego consciousness to a more expanded and pure awareness and also insights into impermanence. And, uh, you know, people have read a lot of the Buddhist teachings about, you know, suffering and uh, the cause of suffering, the, you know, craving and attachment is the cause of suffering and about the karma and, and various, you know, things like that. And so insights is a kind of a, you know, uh, an aha moment. When, you know, might, you might have read over and over certain uh, passages or ideas, but then it's in, in meditation for even a brief, uh, sometimes just a fraction of a second. It's like a, a camera lens opens and closes like that. Sometimes it's that dramatic, but usually it's, it's not. It's a little bit more subtle, but still it's, uh, uh, you know, it's like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like it slips away, but in it, that you, you knew that you saw something was there, you know, it was something different. So these are, you know, just one example of what you call it, insights. And that's why they call it insight uh, meditation. So we've been talking about uh, the insights into impermanence. <clears throat> so the insight into impermanence is as you as you you know develop the ability to just feel and observe you know different stimulations kind of just uh, coming through the senses with physical sensations the sound the thought uh, 
in, in especially tuning in to seeing how quickly they just arise and, and vanish, then uh, at a certain point you, you may get, uh, you know, just see how quickly something arose and vanished, you know, that can actually kind of like shock you almost. Uh, or about how many individual uh, moments or sensations you can notice even in, in a, you know, a very, very short time, uh, even a few seconds, you might notice a hundred different things arising in vanity and that, that uh, you know, it really opens your mind to really uh, understand at a deeper level how deep and profound uh, the mind is and, and also how deeply conditioned our mind is. You might get an insight into that conditioning. Uh, like an example of an insight I had when I was uh, taking my first meditation course in uh, Nepal uh, <clears throat> almost 50 years ago. Uh, you know, after two weeks of meditation, I had some kind of an insight. I can't really ex explain exactly what it is because insights are wordless and uh, and it's hard to sometimes exactly, you know, try to explain it in, uh, you know, in English words. Or, uh, but it, it was like, you know, I wrote it down in a little book. I've been ignorant all my life. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. Today I'm reborn. And that's how powerful an experience it. It was so. I mean, I'm just saying this because that's a, an example of a, you know powerful insights that actually lead to uh, you know they some of them may or may not, but they lead to you know strengthening your uh, of course your uh, motivation, your inspiration, and your uh, sort of determination to to want to keep practicing and also seeing the urgency to to do the practice because again you see how ignorance has been controlling our life for so long in the conditioning uh, that when you really get an insight into that it's uh, <clears throat> so many people have these kind of insights and of course that's why there's a lot of people that are into meditation but anyway uh, coming back to the practice so you know, this getting the there's three levels of insight. One is the insight into impermanence, or what are called the three characteristics of impermanence, called anicca, the Pali word, and then uh, suffering or dukkha, and anatta or uh, no self. These are the three main type of uh, insights and i just mentioned the one about uh, impermanence impermanence doesn't refer to i mean on the external level yeah you you reach out and knock knock a glass of milk off the table and spill oh i need you impermanent, right or as i've already mentioned you get sick or die or accidents but uh, it refers to the how quickly the mind mind moments arise and vanish uh, is the real the deeper meaning of the word I need you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> or also called momentariness the, or the way our brain operates it's you know just uh, operates similar to a computer actually and uh, most of you know how at least somewhat how computers uh, operate. Uh, you know, you feed data into them, and, the, and you know how fast, like a computer, Google, for example, right? I like to use the example because it's it's actually you can almost see it in the mind when you you search something and you start typing in letters. Usually, you type two or three letters, and it. it it second guesses what you're trying to find, right? Based on that, it'll give five uh, 
five choices for probably what you're looking for, right? And then each time you type another letter, it narrows that down or puts new ones in. Uh, and so uh, our mind is operating uh, like that too. And I'm sure everyone has had that experience where, uh, you know, you jump to conclusions or uh, uh, too fast, you know, anticipating a, a certain thing going to happen. <clears throat> happen. So anyway, uh, insight into impermanence is like that. And impermanence is, is a very powerful, uh, because the impermanence is usually the first one. In other words, the, in the Buddha, in the, in, the, in the suttas, in many, many suttas, uh, the Buddha said, uh, and it refers to the five aggregates again. All of the Buddha's teaching is referring to the five aggregates, that there are uh, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Uh, and so the, the Buddha was giving a lecture to the monks. He said, what do you think, monks? Is form, feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness, are they uh, permanent or impermanent? That means, do they just arise, last a moment, and vanish? And they said, impermanent, Venerable Sir. So then he, he got them to admit that they've seen things as impermanence. Then he, then he said, what is impermanent? Is that something, is that a source of happiness or unhappiness? And he said, unhappiness, Venerable Sir. Because normally people cling on to their possessions and their youth and everything else. And when it changes, they you know, get disappointed or unhappy. <clears throat> so they said, uh, whatever is impermanent, that's a source. Of, that's not a source of happiness. So now he, he's got him to admit two things. This is where he corners him into a corner. He said, what is impermanent? And what is uh, not a, uh, cannot be a source of happiness? Is it proper to call that this is mine, this is me, this is myself? And they said, no, Venerable Sir. So if something, according to the Buddhist teaching, if something is self, that means you should be able to control it. And so we say, we say this body is mine or myself, right? Can you control it? Can you say, I'm the, I don't want to get COVID or the flu or any other ailment? I mean, sure, you can take vaccines and you can do stuff to maybe uh, dodge it a bit, but, uh, but especially in terms of old age, sickness, old age, disease, <clears throat> disease and death. So we cannot control that. And your mind. Can you control your mind? Can anybody control their mind today? Of course, somewhat you can when you temporarily when you're, you know, you gain some concentration. But, you know, can you say, sit down and say, no thoughts are going to enter my mind now. And stay there a whole hour without any thoughts. Now, if it was your mind, you should be able to do that, according to the Dhamma. So anyway, this is how the, the Buddha had deduced. I mean, he was very scientific. Again, uh, you know, in, in the Buddha's approach, as we mentioned yesterday, you know, using the body as a laboratory and the mind as a microscope. But he also used kind of deductive reasoning. I just mentioned about the impermanence, and the, the suffering, and the, and the no self. So these are actually the sort of the the hypotheses or the uh, the, the focus of the insight med meditation. <clears throat> so. And so as you are, uh, you know, doing the meditation, when you see how quickly uh, things are just arising and 
in vanishing. And then, but not only that, but you see how quickly the mind uh, uh, reacts to things so quickly. And you see how strong the, the habits are, or especially the negative habits that uh, keep us repeating the, uh, you know, actions and thoughts that we would rather not, you know, keep, uh, keep us repeating things that get us into trouble with others or ourselves and, you know, create conflict and stress uh, with others, including our, whatever, body language, our actual speech, uh, and other mannerisms and so on, uh, that, uh, you know, disturb others. So, and you also see how the, uh, that over-dependence, that we become overly dependent on, you know, sensory stimulation uh, for our, our life and, you know, having cultivated addictions or even if they're not addictions, but just other obsessions and, and habits that don't really bring us uh, what we would call any sort of spiritual benefit or any real benefit, but just you know, waste of time and because we don't have, you know, anything better to do. Uh, and so you, you see, uh, you know, you, and, you know, you get insights into that and then that is what helps to uh, uh, motivate you to, you know, continue to practice. And then but specifically, I wanted to talk about the uh, anatta or no self. Because that is one of the most difficult ones to understand. I mean, it's not that difficult to understand uh, uh, anicca, especially on the superficial levels, or even in the meditative level. Uh, anybody who just develops a you know a certain degree of concentration can you know see how quickly things are just coming and going through the mind, and how quickly the are you know, the perception and the five aggregates are, uh, you know, coming and going, rising and vanishing. Actually, I wanted to uh, mention the similes of the five aggregates. Do you all remember the five aggregates yesterday? Yes, no? Shake your head. Yes. Okay. <laughs> They're the material form, the feelings those form generate, that those feeling, the, the feelings, pleasant or painful or neutral feelings that the material vibrations trigger off. And then simultaneously the perception, that means the recognition of it. You know, you look around and I can, you know, just out of a habit and so on, I can, you know, name and label every face that's there, even just in one quick glance, you know, boom, boom, boom. boom. Uh, those are perceptions, which uh, the perception actually uh, causes a specific object to stand out from the others around it, so it, it, it can be clearly seen as an individual object different from everything else. Now, if it wasn't for perception, you look around and all of everything would be like one dimensional. It would be kind of just looking at a the sort of a painting uh, by an inexperienced painter, you know, that couldn't bring out the depth uh, d dimensions. So uh, the perception has that ability to mark out a specific object that then we can identify and the memory of that object comes into play. Ah, yes, I saw that a month ago. I didn't like that or I really like that. And, and then that triggers off what to do about it. Oh, I'm going to go, go get that object. I'm going to get away from the object or worry and, and so on. <clears throat> Those are the reactions, what I call the reactions to the perceptions, the feelings and perceptions. Like even just, you know, you feel a, an itch on your head and, you know, the habit of just quickly, you know, wanting to go like that, right? So <laughs> that is a, 
an example of the reaction. So it could be a physical reaction or it could be a mental reaction of a thought or so on. And then there's the ego consciousness itself, the sense that I am the one that's experiencing this, these things are happening to me. I am the one that's deciding and liking or disliking and, and so on. <clears throat> and which, which uh, makes the world look like it's kind of a real and uh, flowing process rather than seeing it like a, a movie in slow motion. You know, if you ever went to the movie now, you know, you go to the movie and usually it's, it's dark inside the, the theater, right? Because if it's really bright in the theater, the, the, the images on the screen won't really stand out so well. And, it, you know, they're running uh, quickly. But if it goes on to slow motion, you, you know, it loses its interest. And so <clears throat> the, uh, the, the consciousness is what keeps that, clinging to the consciousness is what keeps that uh, illusion of the, the movie, the reality, uh, kind of in a smooth flowing experience. Anyway, these uh, similes that uh, are for the five aggregates, they're uh, interesting. So the Buddha said that material form is like a piece of foam of you know, froth floating on a river or a lake, you know, froth, that scum that you see on the edge of a lake or a river, you know, greenish kind of slimy scum. Sometimes it's white, but it, it looks like a foam. How many people have seen that on a polluted uh, river or lake? In Germany, they probably don't have any of those. <laughs> uh, so he said, now a, a clear-sighted person if they were to go investigate, now from a distance, you think, oh, that's a piece of foam, styrofoam. Maybe I can go and use that to, you know, for something at home, you know. <laughs> then, but you, know, you go investigate it, and you get a, you know, a stick, and you stick a stick in, and the foam just kind of, you know, it kind of disintegrates. So he said, that is the nature of the material form. Uh, because also, like, we see these beautiful flowers. So if you take a stick and go in there, <laughs> the petals will all scatter <laughs> and uh, so on, too. Now, the, the feelings, the pleasant and painful and neutral feelings, are like water bubbles. So you all see the water bubbles come up from the bottom of a, a lake or, or a river. You know, say a fish is swimming down there, and then the water bubbles come up, or a scuba diver. But... So as, as the bubble, if you're in an, like in an aquarium, and you see the bubbles, they look like something, like a solid or something that's real there, right? As it's going up to the surface. And when it gets to the surface, it goes poof, and it's nothing. So. The Buddha uh, gives that analogy toward uh, pleasant and painful feelings have that uh, kind of a, a nature of a water bubble. <clears throat> and they, we, you know, allow them to allow those feelings to, you know, disturb us and so on. And then the perception is like a, a mirage. You know what a mirage is in a, in a desert, hot desert, it looks like there's some water in the distance, like a lake or some water. So, you know, a thirsty man will get all excited, oh, there's some water there, and he keeps walking, walking, but he never gets there, because it's a, basically a, like an illusion. Or mirage. So, in the same way, these perceptions 
Now again, it's coming back to the material form, it's just a, it's a vibration, it's an energy vibration. But yet, because of perception, it creates the idea of some real thing there that's solid and stands out in uh, time and space. So that's similar to like a, a, a mirage or a magical illusion. And then the, the volitional formations or the reactions. This he likens to a banana tree trunk. How many people have seen a banana tree? I know what a banana tree is. Uh, if you, you know, if you peel the layers off a banana tree, it could be like an onion too, similar to that. You, you peel off these layers and you get in, there's no core inside. It's just a, you know, air, just an empty kind of core. There's no solid core. Uh, so when we investigate our volitional activities, we see this, it's just a, a habit that's been created. It has no essential core to it, or owner uh, or controller to it. <clears throat> and then the consciousness you liken to a, a magician's trick. So, you know, a magician can pull a rabbit out of the hat or cut the person in, in half for so many tricks, right? But there's always an, a, a trick behind it, right? There's a, some kind of an illusion. So this consciousness is giving the illusion of a s smooth, flowing uh, reality with all these things and, and entertainments and, you know, so-called life. And then, uh, unfortunately, then you got even wars and world wars <laughs> and the killing and everything else. But, uh, but anyway, it's a uh, our consciousness basically is is creating that. But more importantly, the sense of our self. So what is no self, it's creating a self out of it. Because it, like I mentioned with the baby that's born, it doesn't have a sense of self when it's born. It takes several months or even six months or it's a, it's a process of gradually uh, the sense of an eye starting to coalesce and get established sort of behind the eyes of a, you know, a, a person. And uh, then they become a, an, a, have this sort of concrete identity. But again, that is sort of just created. Now, when you meditate and you come to a point, this is where the, the insight into no self comes. You know, when you are meditating and you develop the perception of impermanence or you develop a deep level of concentration and uh, non-reaction non toward things, the sense of an I will start to dissolve. Like a uh, Alka-Seltzer tablet in a, a glass of water. Or the analogy I like better is an ice cube floating in water. Now, an ice cube is also made of water, isn't it? But when it's floating in water, it looks like it's different than the water. And if you have several ice cubes floating in a bowl of punch, you know, on a warm summer day, those ice cubes will bang into each other and go clink, 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 clink. Is it? But they're all made of water, but they think they're different. So all these human beings, they all think they're all different. But when you experience that the sense of the eye starting to dissolve, that's like the ice cube melting and becoming uh, the water. And that's exactly what happens in meditation. Uh, when you gain the deeper levels of uh, concentration, mindfulness, and especially of the wisdom. And when you, you start regarding all the five aggregates as this is not me, not mine, not myself, and you stop going after them, uh, you know, you stop worrying about that itch, just let it be, you know, you stop 
you know, don't chase after your anger or your other emotions or pains and you stop reacting to those things. Because the sense of self is in direct proportion to the amount of attention or reaction that you're giving to any of those aggregates or any of the sensory stimulations coming through uh, the senses. And as long as you're identifying even the body, like I am, you know, this is me and I, I am meditating, and, uh, identifying with your emotions and, and then have craving for, <laughs> craving for pleasurable feelings and aversion to painful feelings, that every time you react like that, it strengthens the self of life. And every time you don't react to it, you, you, you know, pull back from that reaction and you're just watching, you know, you're seeing the outline of the sitting body and you're just watching all these creepy crawly sensations going all over. And the mind is just staying, you know, inside, withdrawn inside of itself. It's not going out. Then the sense of self has nothing to stand on and it starts, uh, dissolving like the ice cube uh, dissolving in water and wisdom is sometime an analogy for heat uh, the sword of wisdom is a flaming sword sometimes it's like that so that heat uh, melts the illusions you know, or melts that ice cube of the of the ego and and you can see that happening in meditation even to different degrees or it also melts the feeling of the body, as I mentioned before. You know, at a certain point in your meditation, you might all of a sudden feel like the body is, oh, where are my hands? I don't want to feel it anymore. You know, you, the body might feel very, very light or almost sort of like transparent. And at a certain point, it may just totally dissolve. So that's the same kind of uh, thing. That's called bunga or cessation. Uh, when things that were normally there kind of vanish. And those are very deep uh, uh, knowledges, uh, insight knowledges. So I'm just mentioning these things because uh, if you don't kind of have some idea about it, of course, if you have ideas about it, you know, then you could cause a lot of expectation for it to happen. But uh, still, a lot of people have these experiences and they just go wowie wooey and you know, it doesn't like click, you know, it doesn't, uh, but the insight will, will, uh, because it's connected with the Dhamma, it will, uh, you know, have a certain uh, 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 meaning for you, like, oh, that's, that's the meaning of no self, or the meaning of illusion. Uh, so the illusion isn't some magician up on stage, you know, with some, you know, hidden little trick to cause the illusion, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, it's being created within our mind. And that's, that's actually is called Mara. So Mara is a term in the Buddhist uh, literature to designate the uh, illusion or delusion. And, uh, and the delusions in our mind that keep our mind clinging and grasping and keeping our mind in a very limited, running around in circles like a dog chasing its tail, uh, trying to find happiness in things that you know, are not going to bring happiness. And uh, is keeping us under the sway of ignorance. So that, that's the function of the Mara, but it's basically the you know, the delusions and the illusions that our mind is creating. Now, there's, an, there's a little story that kind of uh, illustrates this to some extent, how, you know, people are in the illusion that, you know, they've had lots of relationships, a lot of them failed, or they had, you know, a lot of money, and then they, they lost it, and they're trying to get more, and they're always saying, one day I'll get it, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll find the perfect thing. <clears throat> there was a story about Mullah Nasruddin. 
How many have heard of old Mula? Right? Mula Nasrudin. So he was a sort of a Sufi mystic or a Sufi a holy man, you know, kind of a funny man. But uh, so he had a lot of students. And so one day he was, you know, trying to teach them. He brought out a big bag of chilies, very hot, you know, chilies. You know, he didn't tell the people what they're doing. You know, they came in and he saw he had you know, a big bag there and he kept on taking the chili out. You know, and it was grimacing and, you know, tears were running down his uh, face. And the students were looking at him and, Mula, Mula, what are you doing? Why, why are you eating those chilies? I'm trying to find a sweet one. <laughs> <laughs> That's how <what laughs> most people are going <laughs> through their life, you know, <laughs> like that. <clears throat> but but I mean, we're doing the same thing in meditation. Eventually, we'll find the sweet one. That means when we have these deep insights and we uh, get an insight into the, the you know, higher kind of happiness that comes through the mind. Now, actually, I had a similar experience myself with the chilies. On my first trip to Sri Lanka back in 1974, uh, that was before there were many flights, you know, international flights. And so one of the ways to get to Sri Lanka was by a ferry boat, a ferry from South India to uh, Northern Sri Lanka. And at that time, uh, Sri Lankans were going to India in order to buy all kind of agricultural goods and other things because uh, the Sri Lankan government had restricted imports. And so people were going to India and they were bringing back huge bags, gunny bags of food, which included chilies and onions and stuff they couldn't get easily in Sri Lanka. And so, you know, I was kind of ignorant to all that. And, I was you know, one of the few kind of Western tourists on the ferry. But, uh, <clears throat> but then when we got to the other side, at the, at the customs, there was a train. I was going to take the train into, down to you know, Colombo. And so there was no seats. It was full. There was no seats. So, but there was a kind of a, a uh, in, in the back of one of the carriages, there was a place where people were storing storing stuff, you know, bags of various things. And a few people were, you know, sitting there or finding a place to lean up and, you know, go to sleep because there was no seat. So I found a spot near this gunny bag. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, naive and, you know, <laughs> so I thought, oh, that'll be, you know, kind of felt it a little bit soft. And so, so I leaned up against this gunny bag. <laughs> And you know, took off my little rucksack and kind of went to sleep. And then I woke up an hour or two later and my head was burning, you know. <laughs> what the heck? You know, my eyes were kind of swollen. And uh, I'd been leaning up against a bag of red chilies. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just saying this to <laughs> uh, illustrate that point about the chilies. I learned my lesson from that. Okay, so you now coming back to the uh, you know the development of the insight. So the uh, you know contemplating the five aggregates, the ability to actually just notice them and to contemplate the meaning, even if you using a little bit of intellectual understanding, like you know even with your own body, you know just feeling it, this body material uh, vibration. And you know, especially with sounds are good for that. When you hear a sound, you can see perceptions arise immediately. You know, even if very quiet, you hear, oh, somebody's walking up the steps, creak, 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 right? And so the mind, you know, Googles it. What's that sound? Oh, that's somebody walking on those steps. Or somebody coming in the back door with a teacher talking. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we can see how quickly 
the mind, that, and then the reaction to it. Like, you can see it that fast with sounds or even certain sensations in the body. Maybe, you know, how many people have experienced, you know, when they're sitting, like, especially little biting sensations. How many people experience something like there was some, maybe some ants crawling on you and, you know, kind of biting you a little bit or something else feel like something crawling on the skin. I saw one hand, anybody else? No. Or well, what those are actually are microbes uh, because, you know, the science, uh, if you look under a microscope, microbes live on our skin, you know, eating dead uh, skin cells and things like that, and uh, partying and uh, things like that. So <laughs> a lot of that, what we feel are, can be things like that. Uh, but anyway, sometimes you feel a stinging sensation, maybe on your ear or your, something in your eye, and you can see it well, and you can immediately see the reaction in the mind, right? So that's like an unpleasant feeling. But those are very good, actually. The more you have of those is very good because that's a training in non-reaction. <clears throat> that's a training to endure discomfort or pain more and more. So it actually, it's a very valuable thing uh, because it helps you to see that Oh, these things are not going to kill me. I'll we'll just let it itch for a while. You, you just watch how that stinging sensation wells up. Maybe it lasts for five or six seconds and it starts to taper off and then vanish. And there's something else, you know, another kind of itch or a, a stinging sensation or a biting sensation or just some other types of aches or pains. And you can see how they just arise, last a second or two, and, you know, vanish very quickly. And just to, to feel that happening all over is becomes very interesting. Wow, look at this. Wow. You know, you have to you have to view meditation as as uh, something interesting. Even within the pain, you have to see it as something interesting. <clears throat> and then also sounds, various sounds. You just see how quickly they, you know, some arise and vanish instantly. Others may, you know, like you hear three or four steps and finish. Then the mind starts to think about it and it stops already. So we waste a lot of time by reacting to things that are already going to vanish by themselves. This is very important to understand. That, you know, the mind is so quickly ready to react to things or to worry about things uh, that if you just have patience and wait a few minutes or maybe longer, that thing is going to change and probably not affect you at all. But our mind creates scenarios where we have fear of something that's going to happen to us because we heard something, you know, or so many other, you know, kind of similar things. Uh, and then those things never come to fruition. But how much time did we waste uh, worrying about it or, you know, taking defensive measures and when the thing never panned out? Did, did that ever happen to any of you? Got a dull lot here. I don't know. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, so, but so just watching this, you know, the attitude of a vipassana meditator is you're sitting and you're, you're, you know, you have that outline of the body, which includes the mind, and you just see it tripping out. You know, the mind creating fireworks, you know, out of certain sensations. And, uh, you know, and, and pains and so on. And you just, to enjoy it, look at this. Wow, freaking now. But you, the mind is, you know, pulled back from it. And you can actually enjoy it. Now, I'll tell you something I did in Sri Lanka when I was a gung-ho monk. A lot of people think I'm crazy, but uh, 
So I was a gung-ho monk back then, you know, that means I wanted to push the limits of <laughs> the mind in, in meditation and so on. So I exposed myself to like poisonous snakes and other types of things to confront my fears and, uh, and then with mosquitoes. So I used to have a kuti in a monastery in a rubber forest. And there was lots of mosquitoes, big ones, bloodthirsty. <laughs> and we used to, I used to sit out in meditation about 5 p.m. when they all came out. And take off the, you know, the upper robe and just ex expose the, the skin. And said, come on, come on. I ate a lot of meat and took the blood of some animals when I was young. Come on, get my blood. I just sat there and allowed them to bite me. And I was just enduring the pain. I was saying, you know, I was sending metta. Please drink. I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I, I know I killed many of your fellows, you know, your flies and mosquitoes earlier and, and did some other things. So this payback. So anyway, I just sat there and endured. And at the end, I was amazed that, you know, there might have been some welts there, but they disappeared after a couple of minutes. And uh, there was no kind of pain from them. And, but you, what you do, you undermine, you bring your awareness to a subtler level underneath the pain. See, there's pain on a gross level, but if you can get your mind underneath, to experience a subtler vibration and hold it there, then these grosser pains on the surface won't uh, affect you so much. And that way you can endure. Uh, I'm not saying that you, you should subject yourself to doing that, but you know, you never know when some situation is going to happen. And not only for body sensations, but for other, you know, uh, noisy, <laughs> situations or anything that's causing you, uh, you know, some disturbance. You have to learn how to get your mind down underneath to feel that subtler vibration in, in the body. And then uh, you won't get uh, disturbed by what is going on in the top. So, so coming back to the meditation, so watching, just watching the the, the play of the five aggregates, you know, and uh, just as you were, it's very similar to taking a balcony seat in the theater. So you go in the theater, you get your ticket, your, your popcorn and soda, you go up to the balcony, and you sit in the balcony and you watch the movie. Now, you know it's a movie, right? But still, you get excited, you know, rooting for the your favorite uh, villain or... <laughs> heroin or something like that, a uh, sport match, uh, you know, but especially like dramas or, you know, uh, steamy <laughs> love scenes or whatever it is, you know, and then they turn on the lights, you know, <laughs> the projector fails and then exposes the, the movie. It's no longer that interesting. But anyway, so, but you go in there and you, uh, you know, you're just watching this movie. So that's the attitude when we meditate. That's why keeping that outline of the body is one of the most powerful uh, kind of tools that we can use in meditation to get that effect of creating this uh, onlooking awareness or detachment. And that's why I have you usually at the beginning of meditation go through and, you know, just focus on your different parts of the body first. Or, you know, in the Goenka style of meditation, they have you scanning the body uh, in order to, uh, you know, feel all these different, uh, every part of the body has a different kind of sensations uh, to it. And once you can get familiar with that, or you move your attention, like from the eyes and feel the face, and you're kind of going down, uh, you know, all the way to the toes, and then coming back and then uh, because of that memory of going through places separately, the, the, the computer mind weaves it into a perception of uh, a body. 
that you can now simultaneously feel some sensations from. And that is a very uh, powerful form of concentration. And then when something happens in that, you have that detached on looking awareness. You already have that detached awareness, like sitting in the in the movie theater, seeing uh, sitting, breathing, sitting, breathing, hearing, hearing, thinking, thinking, you know, itching, itching. Uh, you know, maybe a, a visual image in your mind is you know seeing, seeing. And you just uh, tune into these sort of mind moments, you know, like kind of labeling or identifying the mind moments or the aggregates, ah, material vibration, ah, that's perception. So you keep this objectified distance to it. That's the key. Most people don't reach that level because they're, you know, they've heard different stories and whatever, or they just haven't developed to that point. But that's really the key transition. Uh, to the deeper levels of awareness, where you create this uh, buffer zone. And, and of course, it, uh, has, it depends on the strength of your concentration, but also the wisdom. That's why the wisdom is important, uh, the understanding that uh, comes with it. So another interesting little analogy, I'm just mentioning some of these things because even though maybe you haven't gotten to that point yet, but at some point you you may have an experience and oh yeah that's what you know, and that's supposed to happen okay that's you know, I'm not going crazy you know that's that's part of the process. <clears throat> uh, so uh, one of a nice little when you when you do have a good sense of this. Uh, you know, sort of the outline of the body there and the breathing is in the middle and, you know, various things are coming and going and even little, you know, irritating sensations and you're just relaxed. And then there's the analogy of a, a spider web. So our nervous system is similar to a spider web. So a spider web, you know, a spider attaches part of it to, you know, a tree branch or a doorknob or, you know, it's got five or six uh, places where the web is attached. So the nervous system attached to the eyes, the ears, the skin, the tongue, the nose, and also the mind itself. And these are all attached to the nervous system. And when anything uh, flies into the sense organ, like a sound touches the ear, it vibrates uh, the web. And the spider is like our consciousness, sitting at the outside of the web. Then it feels the vibration of the web and it kind of wakes up. What's that? And then it rushes in to uh, wrap up the uh, object. So that's actually, that's very similar to how our mind operates. Uh, and especially when you're doing this meditation and you can see the urge for the mind to go after something, even if you have this outline of the body there, you get a painful sensation arising. You can see that kind of urge that awakens the spider, the mind. Then you can see that irritation, that urge to want to get rid of it, but because you have insight, you say, no, it's not that bad, I'll endure it. And you just continue to watch it, see how it builds up to a peak, last 10 or 15 seconds, maybe a little longer, but then it starts to fizzle out and vanish. And uh, you didn't have to waste energy scratching it because it's gonna vanish anyway. And actually that brings joy to you when you actually see that you're making sort of some progress in the meditation, that's called the joy. The enlightenment factor of joy is when you're starting to get the kind of insights and experiences to see that, you know, to validate what the Buddha was talking about. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so that kind of just, uh, you know, when you're sitting there, you can kind of bring this kind of image to mind of just a 
you know, the spider web, the, the nervous system, like a spider web. And uh, it can add a, a little bit of uh, interest to the, to the meditation. It gives the mind a little bit something to do. Because the mind's always wanting to do something, right? But most of it is useless things that distract our meditation. But these kind of uh, 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 practice of the meditation or using some of these little tools can uh, help to, you know, enhance it. And, and then the one that I like the most is the empty village or the empty house simile. So when you, you know, again, as you're sitting in, just observing all these things coming and going, the six senses, but there's no reaction, then the, the sen you can see that sense of I starting to kind of fade away a little bit. I mean, it's a subtle thing, but you can notice it because you see the difference in when the, the mind is, you know, <laughs> as opposed to when it gets more relaxed and it's no longer, you know, worrying about the pains or when it's going to be over or anything else. And uh, so you can see that, that sense of the eye kind of starting to fade away. <clears throat> and then it sort of feels like an empty house or an empty village. The Buddha used this simile, the six senses, six-fold sense sphere is like an empty uh, village. There's, he gives a little story about some robbers chasing some man was being chased by robbers in the forest and they had swords, you know, up wanting to, you know, cut the person's head off. And he sees a village and he runs in there to get help, thinking he's going to find some help in there. And uh, he goes every door and no, no one's home. It was an empty village. Uh, you know, and, and then he saw a ghost and got scared and, and ran out. <laughs> but, so in the same way, we go to our senses for enjoyment. You know, our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. Even our mind, we like to think of fantasies, you know, uh, or uh, any other enjoyment. But, in the end, most of them never give us any lasting sort of, you know, enjoyment. So <clears throat> you, so you get the feeling of being an empty house. There's nobody home reacting. They say the doors and windows of the house are open. Birds are flying in and out. Snakes are crawling in and out. But there's no, there's no one home there to. But maybe there's a seeing eye camera in the house, you know, what they call CCTV closed circuit and it can see things, but the camera doesn't freak out if it sees a snake going by, does it? Maybe the newfangled ones, I don't know. Yeah. So our awareness is just like a, a silent closed circuit uh, camera or a surveillance camera. You know, it picks up everything that's happening, but it can't do anything. And that is similar to this stage of, uh, awareness in which the sense of the self fades away, but there's still awareness, but there's, there's no sense of these things are happening to uh, a me or an I. And that is very powerful insights. So <clears throat> anyway, I'm just mentioning these things because, uh, you know, similar to when I so people might get these things and just say, oh, that's cool, that's neat, but they won't relate it back to, oh, that's what the Buddha taught. Right? Okay. It's like when I was younger, in the, uh, you know, when I was like, like a, a hippie, right, and taking uh, psychedelic drugs. And, you know, we didn't have any spiritual background at that time. That was before I knew anything about Eastern teachings and so on. And uh, it was just all wowie wooey, you know, and even, you know, losing the sense of the body and the self and it was wowie wooey. And people killed themselves from that though. You know, they, like the examples of some people 
took acid on top of a skyscraper and one person thought they could fly because the feeling of their body became so light and they were deluded that they could fly and they jumped off the building and killed themselves. It was a very famous incident back in the 60s. And another person thought they had the strength or he could stop a locomotive. You know, they were high on these drugs. They were creating this illusion that of invincibility or whatever. And they stood out and, of course, got flattened and killed by a train. And there's numerous examples of that sort of thing back in the day. Uh, and Or just, you know, tripping around and so on, but not uh, really giving any uh, sort of spiritual insights. I mean, sometimes they did later on, but <clears throat> because they didn't have anything to relate to, to. That's the main thing. Okay, anyway, I think uh, that may be enough for now. But I just want to finish this uh, discussion about the process of, of insight, because again, these are the stages that the mind goes through in getting deeper and deeper insights into, uh, you know, the, what, what the Buddha taught, uh, Anicca Dukkaranatta, and about understanding how suffering is created through our illusions and being trapped in our uh, karmic created habits and so on, and how we can be able to gradually uh, cut them. And I'll talk more about that probably tomorrow. Uh, Okay, so is there any questions that came up? You can ask them, you can raise their hands. Anybody out there uh, listening over Zoom have any uh, questions uh, based on that talk? How many are there? Now, the people that are here, you can write them down. If there's no questions here, I'll take one. You know, your question. Is there one? Yes. Ante? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, I really liked your similes and because they were, they were very concrete and based on the, your vast knowledge and your investigation of the body of the Rupa. Um, a lot, you know, so when you, when you were talking about that uh, incident, up your experience with the mosquitoes, let's say, and uh, other, other um, in, in, you know, uh, types of, of sensations that uh, for most people uh, is a bad thing. And that's what helps it, you know, become a bad thing because they're thinking that. Uh, and then when, when after a, a certain, a, a, a time, present moment time, you know, you, you, you realize that uh, any kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, that damage was vanishing because you, you use the words that uh, underneath the, those uh, feelings on the top of the skin, so I immediately thought of uh, iron uh, kung fu. fu it's called the uh, um, uh, the the iron uh, uh, iron shirt. It's iron shirt, and and uh, you know China and stuff like that, and Japan, uh, where they, they basically were able to hold off bullets, supposedly, but. Uh, Frank, yeah. don't don't go into all these questions because it's going to take too long. You know, you have to get right to the point. You know, well, I just think it was, it, you know, you know, just a brilliant uh, simile and also uh, concrete. In other words, uh, an actual an actual truth. So I pre appreciate your uh, you know, setting on the. Well, know, I mean sure. that that's why I you know, give these sort of examples because they are from my own experience and they would have helped me to, uh, you know, develop my own understanding and, and uh, you know, 
of, of, of the teachings and uh, you know that it does take you know the a meditator is cons you know it has to be uh, the attitude of a warrior you know taking things as a challenge not to shrink away from uh, pain or difficult situations just because we think of certain things because we'll never grow that way so that's very true yeah Buddha was born into the warrior uh, caste okay thank you frank uh, do you have one question? We'll take one more question. <clears throat> but the, the aggregate of consciousness in the five body right? Could you clarify? Um, you said like it's a sense of ego. How is it in what? In what? <clears throat> should I start from the beginning? No, just... In what relationship is it to the uh, uh, six consciousnesses like ear, I? Uh, nose, touch, mind, the six consciousnesses and the consciousness in the um, five aggregates. Well, consciousness is one of the five aggregates. Right, but we always, you know, say it's like one of the six consciousnesses, never like. Well, I, yeah, actually, the, the sense of an eye, the, the Buddha gives a, a simile of the sense of an eye. It's like, let's say, a flower. So you, know, you have a, a fragrant flower, and the, the petals are giving off some fragrance. The, the, the stem inside, the, what do they call it, pistol, or pistol, whatever, different parts of the flower are giving this aroma. But that uh, aroma doesn't necessarily <clears throat> fit to just to, you know, is in just one part. It uh, you know, arises because of all that. So the sense of the self, uh, when all the five aggregates are there together, the sense of the I then uh, appears to be you know, real. But because uh, it's associated with the consciousness uh, and the because what I say, well, when the baby is born, it doesn't have a sense of I in it. But as it starts learning language and people start giving it things and it starts to move around and <laughs> want things and have more experiences of pleasure and pain, then this sense of the I gets established there uh, and <clears throat> it becomes part of the consciousness. Uh, so that's why I usually to keep it uh, kind of uh, simple, because these, these are very deep uh, concepts and things to understand, very deep. Uh, so we have to try to simplify them to a point where we might be able to at least get an idea. So uh, the <clears throat> that sense of the, the, the consciousness is the ego consciousness because every person has ego consciousness until they become an arhant or, or they die. You know, after the time they acquire it as a baby, uh, you know, they have the, the sense of I there. Uh, so just so to keep it simple, when I say the consciousness, I, I use the term ego consciousness. Because if you didn't have ego consciousness, you'd already be a, an arhant. Uh, and you wouldn't need to practice meditation even. So, um, but, but, you know, the, the delusion comes from all those things together that, you know, helps to feed the, the sense of mind. Could you say it's a combined sense of all Because we look at the body and we, oh, that's my body. We feel a pain, oh, that pain is happening to me. Uh, you know, I am seeing this. We, all, as I already mentioned, I, me, and mine is behind every, you know, thought that we have. So, if that I was to belong to any of those, I would say, you know, it's, it's the consciousness. But, in technically speaking, you know, if you go into the Abhidhamma or other things, you know, it it may not uh, say precisely that. Yeah, because it's always confusing. They always say there is one of the six consciousnesses, and then the five aggregates. They say just a consciousness. 
So I just never could figure out. No, we it. say eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind consciousness. But it's just consciousness working through either one of those sense organs. So when the consciousness is being is seeing through the eye, we call it eye consciousness. But it's, it's, it's the same, the source of that consciousness is the same, awareness. But when each uh, sense organ is uh, stimulated, then that consciousness goes out through that medium to cognize the, the sound, the sight, the smell, the taste, the touch, or the thought. But it's just one consciousness. It's, isn't the simile of fire like Buddha mentions like the fire, whatever it it's arises from, the wood fire or like right? Fire. Yeah, we get a, a grass fire, a wood fire, a dung fire, a, a charcoal fire, a gas fire. Right? The, the flame is the same, but it's coming from different sources. So yeah, that that could be a a similar analogy about that. But it's that thing which is giving light. It, it's the knowing faculty. Consciousness is the knowing faculty. Without that, we basically were unconscious. And it is very difficult to exactly, you know, even, even scientists with all their wonderful, they still don't understand consciousness or what it is, really. Not from the Buddhist point of view, anyway. Okay. Anyway, I think that'd be enough now because uh... well, there is a question on the chat, Chester. Is that right? There are two types of consciousness, the ego conscious and transcendental expanded consciousness. Well, yeah, I do mention that, but it wouldn't be consciousness at that point. I like to make the distinction uh, between consciousness and awareness. Now, you could say transcendental uh, uh, I prefer to use the term awareness rather than consciousness. Because consciousness implies that you're conscious of something. In awareness, there's just awareness without any object or any sense of self there. There is awareness. And that's called, we call it, we could call that transcendental because it transcends the subject object relationship, the duality. So we always see everything in terms of duality. There's you know, two sides of everything, hot and cold, black and white, you know, night and day, male, female, all these things. So, but this is created in the mind. So when you reach that level where the mind is no longer producing perceptions and uh, the memory is sort of cut off, that, uh, that projection stops. And that's what, what I would call more the awareness, or sometimes it's called pure awareness because it's not diluted or polluted with greed, hatred, and delusion. Is there a word in the suttas Buddha refers to that uh, we now use awareness? How, I mean, Anidasana vinyana. Anidasana vinyana. Anidasana vinyana is a, a, a Pali word. It's signless consciousness. So the term consciousness is there, but a signless consciousness. I mean, it doesn't leave any signs. There's no sign to it, like eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or mind, or and, this or that. And the word for consciousness in five aggregates, is it vinyana? Vinyana is used in all those terms, yes. Uh, Again, these are, you know, it's, these are very, difficult concepts to use, especially trying to say it in English, because the English language wasn't made for Dhamma, you know. Uh, and so, you know, it's difficult. No, that's helpful, thank you. Okay, so why don't you just uh, straighten up for a moment, just take a deep, slow breath, hold your breath in the lungs for as long as you comfortably can, just feel those sensations. You can follow the out breath down to the end to feel that 
last bit of air go out of the lungs and pause there for a couple seconds without any breath. Breathe in again when you're ready. Okay, so just doing that one simple breath like that, did anybody feel an effect of that? That's why I say, you know, doing this, this kind of breathing is, you know, like a, a miracle pill, especially for just immediately relaxing and, and getting the mind out of its uh, push to the future. Okay, go ahead and mindfully stand up and we'll do a little standing awareness followed by perhaps some walking or a few stretches before sitting down again. Use the restroom if you need to. Try to keep some of these things that I was talking about in your mind and the problem. 